Welcome to the Over the Hump Podcast. Your gateway to the world of the iconic Brahmin breed of cattle. At BRC Ranch, our passion for Brahmin cattle runs deep. Join us as we delve into the heart of this extraordinary breed, unveiling its rich history, exploring industry trends, and sharing captivating stories that define the American Brahmin. BRC Ranch stands as the pinnacle of Brahmin excellence in America, boasting a decade-long legacy of champions and housing the finest Brahmin bulls worldwide. It's not just about cattle, it's about a legacy that reverberates across ranches and hearts. Brought to you by BRC Ranch, where the Brahmin legacy thrives and stories are woven into the very fabric of ranching. This is Over the Hump, and now your hosts, Brendan Cotrer, Rachel Cotrer, and Keaton Dodd. Welcome to the Over the Hump podcast, where we talk about all things Brahmin cattle. In today's episode, Brandon and I are very privileged to have Stuart Watkins, a visionary Brahmin breeder at Watkins Cattle Company of Welsh, Louisiana. As one of the top young judges and breeders of Brahmin cattle worldwide and the well-known breeder of WCC Maximus, you're in for a real treat today. So let's get right into it, over the hump. Welcome to the next episode of Over the Hump Podcast, and we are Brandon and I are here today with one of our best friends and one of the top young Brahmin breeders in the world, Stuart Watkins of Watkins Cattle Company. Welcome, Stuart. Well, thank you all for having me on. Um, between our daily group text messages and just our constant conversations, this doesn't even feel probably like an interview. It just feels like a normal extension of our everyday life for the most part. <laughs> I know, but we, except everything we talk about will be broadcast to the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. So our plan today is just to visit and talk about, you know, we just kind of an outline, like history of your ranch, some of the more prominent cattle that you've been involved with, your view for the Brahmin breed. Um, and we'll just chat away. And if we need to make two episodes, we can do so. <laughs> So. Perfect. Look forward to it. So, Stuart, you and I are the same age, and we kind of grew up showing the same time. Can you give us a little history on, on that? That's from what I know you from, from the late 90s, early 2000s. But it's, can you give us a little history of, of, of Watkins cattle? Absolutely. Um, so I, there's never a time in my life that I can recall where we didn't have Brahmin cattle for the most part. Um, whenever I was a very young child, uh, both my parents had very large herds of commercial Brahmin influenced cattle. And it's interesting. I think now at the age of 36, I think more about those times growing up um, in a commercial background. And it even it's even more now more so applicable to the type of cattle that we're breeding in a registered Brahmin program um, in 2023 and moving on into 2024. Uh, and so I think my perspective on kind of where we are and where we're going, a lot of it is was really shaped from, you know, those days as, as being a very young child and a little boy, just, just with my dad and, and spending, you know, every moment of every day uh, surrounded by large herds of, of Brahmin influenced cattle. Um, Probably up until the age I was about eight or nine, we ran close to about a thousand head of commercial type Brahmin cattle. So I've seen things on a very large spectrum. Uh, and then also now we have a very, you know, what I find is a very, you know, well oiled machine when it comes to a, a herd of cattle now that's very specific. Um, and you don't need big numbers to accomplish. Uh, where you're going or what you're trying to achieve uh, in the registered Brahmin business. In the, in the mid to late 90s, I was old enough to start showing Brahmin cattle. And so my parents had a lot of friends, of course, growing up on the Louisiana Gulf Coast, you know, a lot of great registered Brahmin programs just right outside our back door. Uh, and so they began investing in Brahmin heifers. 
not only for their own herd, but also for me, Caroline and Olivia to start showing. Um, and we were just so fortunate to not only over, you know, almost 30 years now buy really good genetics, but have so many great people guide us and mentor us along the way. And, and I think uh, I, I'm so lucky to have a father who's just a very much a lifelong learner. And he's so open uh, to, you know, what can be done better or, you know, how we can do things different. And so there's so many people that really shaped um, our journey uh, in, in from commercial Brahmin type cattle now to a registered program. And uh, we've had a lot of success along the way. And I think it's it's because of those people, really. And then, you know, the genetics and the cattle uh, all fall into line uh, in, in that order. So I know you primarily have red Brahmin cattle now, but when we were younger, you had you, you showed gray Brahmins. Have you always had a mixture of both or if, you know? For the most part, my dad always likes to tell the story when he married my mom. My mom was actually running a red Brahmin bull on commercial Brahmin influence type cattle. And so it's it's funny now, 30 something years later, uh, you know, we predominantly have a herd of, of what we're known for is, is registered red Brahmin cattle. But we do have a herd of gray Brahmin cattle. And, and I would say the main focus in our gray herd is to really meet that demand of that F1 producer in Louisiana. We sell a lot of Brahmin heifers, a lot of gray Brahmin heifers to a lot of F1 guys, you know, that are running those those females on Hereford or Angus bulls along the Louisiana Gulf Coast. Uh, and so our program is kind of in two facets. You know, we have our, our registered red Brahmin cattle that, you know, very fortunately, have had such a global impact. Uh, and then we have our, you know, kind of our other team of gray cattle that are, are best suited, in my opinion, for really meeting that need of that commercial producer um, in, in our own environment. But yes, the first the first type of cattle that we grew up showing were gray Brahmin cattle. We sourced a lot of initial females from uh, Johnny Jeffcoat's Double A, a uh, Double J Ranch, um, Colleen Rush, now Calendar. Uh, that her family really put some great ones in our hands uh, and that really pushed us forward. And then we kind of, you know, then, you know, uh, looked at other genetics in central Texas and, and throughout the, the Collins Brahmin ranch cattle really did a lot of great things for me um, as well as the tic-tac-toe uh, ranch herds, both red and gray uh, really shaped, shaped, you know, what the herd is now. Yeah, I would I mean besides the the immediate family of Tic Tac Toe Ranch, I would consider you probably one of the foremost experts on that bloodline, which is a very uh, very successful bloodline when you look at the history of our breed. It is, you know, and I, and I was so lucky to have both Max and Shirley as just as as great mentors to me as a young kid. Shirley is still just such a big part of my life, and and I love to bounce ideas and and genetic combinations, you know, off of her. Um, and then I was very familiar with the herd, not only as a kid, but then as a young adult, I, I base out of Austin, Texas, the ranch is about two hours. The ranch was about two hours from where I live. And I, I just spent a lot of time marketing the genetics alongside, uh, our, our cattle. And, uh, I got to travel the world and, and help, you know, advance those genetics in several countries alongside what I was doing with our red Brahmin cattle. Uh, so that those cattle were definitely a, such a big part of my life. Yeah. Now tell our listeners a little bit about your involvement in the AJBA growing up, um, as well, you know, Brandon and me were, are both former members as you are and all of your family is and, and talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I think that's one of the, the real key aspects of kind of our success as we adapted from kind of a a more junior focused type program to a, a registered ranch is my parents really had the foresight to get us involved in AJBA really early on. Um, we were so lucky to have a very strong state junior organization. And during our tenure there, it was run by Miss Cindy Prather, who, you know, just really built an incredible program in Louisiana. And then from there, I really got involved in AJBA as a director uh, from probably the time I was in high school all the way up until maybe my sophomore year of college, uh, made some lifelong friends. I was on the board with Brandon, which was so much oh, fun. And, and oh my gosh, life. I did I did not know that until just <laughs> and now. For, and 
Brandon says we were the same age. Brandon's a little bit older than me, um, but our lives now have gone so full circle, you know, from our days in AJBA. And, and Brandon and I shared so many close friends specifically in Louisiana uh, with the Smith Brahman crew. And so it really is kind of like one big family. And, and uh, you know, those, those kind of lifelong experiences that, you know, I had through AJBA definitely just kind of carried on. Um, and it created this network. And if you look around, there's people like me and Brandon and others that we're now doing business on a regular basis with each other. Uh, and that, you know, comes at no surprise that really started, um, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. What was your, what was the last all American you showed at? Oh, the last all American I was at, I think was Lawton, Oklahoma. So I would have graduated in 2006 um, now, were you, were either of you on the junior board when we had the scandalous rule come out of the dress code, creating the dress code? It was. That was, <laughs> the, the dress code started, the dress code started in 2003 <laughs> after the show in Waco, Kinder. Texas. I Waco. Sure it was Waco or was it Kinder? Was it due to Brandon removing his shirt? Um, uh, no, at the welcome supper, I don't think he was the offender. I don't remember that at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, not because I, not because I, of anything outside affecting my thinking. I just don't remember it. <laughs> I don't think it ever happened. <laughs> but yes, that um, that topic, yeah, yeah, definitely started during my time on uh, on the board of directors. Yeah, these are things people like to know. <laughs> yeah, it's true, it's true, yeah. But um, moving, I mean, that was a great history. And then I think like, as you move into kind of the, you know, evolution of Watkins Cattle Company, um, there there's the, a bull that really puts y'all on the map, Maximus. And every Brahmin breeder on the world knows of Maximus. But if you would share with us, you know, tell us the story of Maximus. Tell how you you got to thinking about breeding the bull, um, what he was like as a young bull, you know, and just talk about, let's just talk about Maximus. Yeah, totally. Um, to reference Judd Cullors, we had a conversation not too long ago and he was like, man, Stu, it just, it really takes just that one, you know what I mean? To just set yourself apart and and to really push your program and, and, and give you that notoriety. I tell people all the time that bull changed my life um, in so many ways. Uh, I'm a better breeder because of that bull. Um, I am a better person in a lot of ways because of that bull. Uh, and so it really took that one to kind of shape, you know, what the future was going to be for me in this business. Um, we purchased, actually I purchased, a red female from Tic Tac Toe, uh, actually right when I graduated, um, had a little bit of money set aside, wanted to kind of continue and dabble in the reds a little bit. Um, I won the all American two years prior with a red female from Tic Tac Toe. Uh, and so I, I just kind of wanted a small group that was just kind of, you know, could set themselves apart. And so this 335 cow that we bought, um, ended up getting injured uh, at home. Uh, we were never able to show her. Uh, and long story short, she broke a leg and it was, you know, thought we were going to have to put her down and, you know, never thought we, you know, she'd rebound from that and actually make a productive cow. But she did. Uh, and her first her first calf was a calf that was branded 55 over two. That was the first red Brahmin that we produced on the ranch uh in 2012 and that cow went on to become the national champion cow in 2014 so after that happened or or when we realized you know this cow could really produce a top one for us we flushed that cow the same way and uh did a reverse female sort on the semen for that IVF and we've got a great crew of heifers and then dad calls me and says, you know, it was sometime in, I think, beginning of April. And he was like, man, we've got a incredible bull calf by accident. And that bull calf was the Maximus bull. And and dad just said from day one, he said, man, this this bull just has something different about him. Uh, and so we put that bull in the hands of Shirley and Tammy Watts. He lived his show career lives 
uh, his show career life at Tic Tac Toe, which was something that was really fun for all of us. Uh, and then from there, I think kind of the rest is, is history, I guess. Um, you know, he's in probably five continents around the world and countless countries. And, you know, he's kind of that bull that everybody looks to, to kind of improve their herds, uh, in red Brahmin cattle. I, I would say that's kind of the number one reason why people want to use Maximus is to kind of just increase quality all around. But, you know, he's, he's not only was a mistake from a reverse sort, uh, but because his mother had an injury as basically a replacement heifer, um, you know, it's, it's unreal that this bull is even a thing, you know, at this point. So, uh, you know, yeah, I, God, I was going to say before we got too much farther, we pumped the brakes on that a little bit, how, how, Things that weren't necessarily supposed to happen just kind of fall into place. And, fall into place. And, I mean, damn, it's any, like a secret any, recipe, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, his mother is an incredible cow, but probably, you know, because of the industry, it uh, the injury she sustained, like probably any other rancher would have put a bullet in her head. And, and my dad just had the patience just to give her every chance she, you know, could have to rebound. Uh, and then her first natural calf is a national champion. We IVF her, and then we get Maximus and Blair and Solange um, and the Foxy cow and just cows that have shaped, you know, our program, a fun cow that's been, you know, that we own, you know, jointly with you and Molly. Um, and so it's, you know, a very, very special mating and very special cattle that probably should have never have been, uh, if that makes any sense. That's that's really awesome. Because you think about a lot of times breeding these cattle and you, you do embryo work and even through the natural, a cow might only have one really good one. But that cow sure. in one flush had some fantastic ones. Fantastic and, uh, ones, yeah. It's, it's just amazing the production of that cow. Now, uh, I know you – what what was that – what did you say that that cow was sired by? That cow was out of Doc McKinney's um, MK349 bull. And the mother to that cow, the mother to the 335 tic-tac-toe cow was a cow branded 961. That was one of my all-time favorite cows at the ranch. She was a, a Fontenot 125 daughter. And then even for, further from there goes back to, um, I think, 3X56 line maybe. Um, so just a really open pedigree. And I think when I really – wanted to push forward and, and create something special and different with red Brahmin cattle. I, I really felt the need to create something of my own um, and avoid probably the most popular genetics that were in red Brahmin cattle in the last 20 or 30 years. I think if, if people are going to come to you, um, they're going to come to you for quality. And, and when you're a young ranch, that's maybe not as established established they are coming to you because you have something different. And something that can work for them. Uh, and so that 335 cow was kind of our first dabble into the Red Brahmins. And then I became really good friends uh, with another Louisiana gal by the name of Dinah Wall. And I thought, well, if I could source some top HK cows, and the mission was take those type of cows, and I'm, I'm going to go to Hudgens, and I'm going to find the best true red hided bull that I possibly can. And for that first generation, I'm going to cross a hundred years worth of great red Brahmin genetics with a hundred years worth of great American, maybe gray Brahmin type genetics and really kind of carve out something that's just different for us. Uh, and so that was kind of my focus when we first started in the red Brahmin business was let's create a, a type of cow that's very open pedigreed uh, and a cow that in, the type of cattle we can build a future around because the pedigrees are going to be so different. Yeah. Well, you, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said you are breeding a consistent type of animal and it's very evident across the world that Watkins cattle company is known for that consistent type. You know, to me, I mean, as an outsider, I would describe the Watkins cattle as very, as functional first, you know, very moderate framed, uh, good mothers, a good breed character, you know, just the foundation of the things that would work anywhere. Um, and you, you have a solid 
type, a, a vision in people's head of what a Watkins animal looks like. And to me, that's the mark of a true breeder. You know, anybody can just come up with random stuff, you know, but to consistently stamp out that quality time and time again, generation after generation, that's what really makes a true breeder. And I really, I really enjoy creating something that people want long before they knew they even wanted it. Uh, You know, when I first started really pushing the red Brahmin genetics and and creating that program, I felt we were kind of on the cusp of kind of what reds could do. Uh, And a big part of those decisions were, how can we make these cattle better? Um, because, you know, since probably the 1980s and 90s, you know, the reds were kind of the, the you know, redheaded or second stepchild to the grays uh, as it relates to quality. And, and I might take some heat for that because, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's some great red cattle in, in, our, in our breed's history. But I think when you compare them from a performance standpoint to the grays and just an overall quality standpoint to the grays, there was there was a something was missing there. Uh, and so I remember when I graduated college and telling dad, you know, I really think that we have you know the opportunity to breed some cattle that are a little bit different from a quality standpoint uh, and people will seek that. Uh, and so that's kind of always what I've had in mind is trying to create something that people will want long before they really knew they even wanted it. And I think that's kind of how you, you know, really solidify yourself in that role. You know, you had mentioned you might take some heat for, for saying what you just did. Well, if that's the case, I'm going to, I'm going to probably take some with you and we'll share the, share the heat. Cause growing up in over in Mississippi, I grew up with red Brahmin cattle and the traditional cattle that we had were more Indu type cattle from the 1980s that a lot of, a lot would have some, some uh, they would have a lot of frame size, but not a lot of muscle to go with it. They've had some udder issues, had some calf vigor issues, and just a, a lot of, of of things working against them. But what I've seen you be able to do in modernizing these red Brahmin cattle, make them more functional, make them moderate, but keep some shape and muscle in in those cattle, and, and really cleaning up some udders is just phenomenal. And I I, I applaud you for that. And I think that's a great direction that you're heading. You know, again, I think it also goes back to just my dad's lifelong history of just being in the commercial sector of, of the cattle business. And and those all those things that you just named of why we've been successful with the Red Brahmin cattle are truly why you would be successful in a commercial operation. Uh, and so really putting a big focus on those traits that every cattleman can rally behind is is always at the focus of what we're doing and and what's been so exciting is to see such big beef countries like Argentina and Paraguay uh man they got onto Mac, our Maximus bull so early as being kind of a a, a different avenue and a, and a new opportunity for them to kind of interject into those big beef industries in those countries. So when those guys are knocking at your door to use your genetics, uh, you know, you're definitely, you're definitely doing something right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we talked about Maximus for probably about 10 minutes and I know we could continue to talk about him, but (laughs) let's move on to what was next after Maximus because um, you said it takes one to set you apart, but in order to keep that legacy going, you've got to keep going and you've got to, you know, do do more than just one a one hit wonder, you know, and you've definitely done that. So talk us through what what was next after Maximus. So I think definitely there was a lot of mistakes after Maximus. And one of those being because we are a smaller red Brahmin herd, we place such a big emphasis emphasis on IVF and reverse sorting semen. And so, you know, for the past 10 years now, people really know us, yes, for Maximus, but also some of these really timeless type females that we've been able to make. But I really messed up and I, I wasn't making any bulls along the way, you know, because I was reverse sorting all the semen, using a lot of sex AI semen just within the own within our own herd. And I look back at those years and, and man, we were using cattle that should have been creating some bulls along the way. And so I think that's where I've really made this shift, a conscientious shift right now to say, you know, for these cattle that had these great production records, 
that are real world type cattle that everyone, you know, can identify as being elite um, because of what they're doing in the real world. Those type of cattle should also be creating some some of the next herd sires. And so our program right now is really focused on we've identified those cows and how we can get some bulls, I guess, from those lines. We've gone out and we've outsourced and we brought in some bulls, uh, some bulls that we've either partnered on uh, to use and 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 not reverse sorting the semen or not using the sex AI semen or just running bulls on cows uh, in, a, in a much bigger way. So I think, you know, that's what I'm focused on right now is, is what is that next one? You know, let's make that next one because we, you know, we've kind of been shooting ourselves in the foot for not focusing on that. It, it's it's funny you say that as as young breeders earlier in our career, you know, everybody wants that the females and they're like, oh, that's female, definitely. female, that, you, you want those it produces me. many okay. <laughs> well, it produces, it produces as many of them as you can but then yep. at some point along the way you realize uh hey i, I need some bulls and yeah. and I, I think that's part of the maturity of a breeder as they go through their 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 breeding program is once you reach that point it's it's like you're saying it's it's you have to realize that you might be making a mistake and then you jump into bull mode and you realize that bulls can be just as valuable, if not more valuable than the females at certain times, if you can make the right ones. And uh, Absolutely. When you can make that jump and become, make enough name for yourself, produce the right kind of cattle that you can make bulls that have a demand behind them and people seek out. That's, that's really cool. And that might be one of the most rewarding things. Um, Absolutely. I I tell people right now, one of our main focus right now is I want to breed bulls that are going to go to people and breed cows. And I want to breed females that are going to go into people's herds and raise calves till they're 15 plus. Um, And so I think when we stick to that narrative and just constantly improve the quality and, 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 you know, genetic value from there and performance from there, um, that's that's where we're really getting ahead you know, quite frankly. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of what my mission is right now is to, you know, not only focus on those top females that we've been able to, to make, but then, you know, we've got to get some, some more good bulls out there. Uh, yeah. and, and I've been lucky to travel the globe looking specifically at red Brahmin bulls and just trying to decide what, what I want next, you know? Um, and that's given me just this runway to really look at, where to take the genetics and then where to take the quality as well. If there's anyone who understands the need for branding, it's a cattle rancher. For 25 years, Ranch House Designs have been crafting custom logos for ranches just like yours around the country. And there's nothing more important than the right logo for building your brand. A logo is the handshake your ranch needs to capture the attention of potential clients and customers. So, turn to Ranch House Designs to make the solid first impression your ranch deserves. Let's get branding your ranch today. Go online to ranchhousedesigns.com. You mentioned traveling and things like that and and getting out and seeing other herds and what's working in the different environments. I know within our own program, that kind of helps us stay abreast of the pulse of the industry and what's really out there going on because it's so easy for a breeder if you're staying right there in your lane to get uh, tunnel vision and you just keep going one way that you lose might lose sight along the way but um, you know being able to travel and stuff like that and and uh, get out and see what's really working do y'all remember okay so my first international trip was that trip to Nicaragua, like in 2023, yeah. 24 or 2014, 2013, maybe sooner than that. I don't know. Um, I was right out of college whenever I booked that trip. But uh, just from that one trip, really, one, I was able to see Brahmin cattle uh, where they thrive in the tropics. Uh, they, they thrive in South Louisiana, but they really thrive in the tropics. And then two, I mean, the three of us became really best friends from that trip. So, you know, I was just rewarded in so many ways, just right out the gate, you know, on my first international trip. And, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that, 
that trip specifically for anything because we had so much fun. On that trip, I remember the machine guns everywhere. <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> the machine and, guns, clowns, and very high in ponies. I think is the, <laughs> are the. <laughs> but for me, for me, that was one of our earlier trips too. Yeah. And and I remember, um, you know, being here in the USA, and I I thought that everybody internationally was using all USA bulls. And I honestly thought I was going to see a lot of cattle sired by some of our bulls. And I got down to the show and I think there was like one animal sired by one of my bulls. And that opened my eyes that like, Hey, there is, there's a lot, there's a lot bigger world out here than just what I see in the USA. And especially at a global level, you know, that there's a lot of good animals out there and breeders have choices and that made us just want to breed better bulls so that when we do go to these shows, we have a lot more and sired some, by our bulls. Something you know? to look forward to when you get there and, and oh, absolutely see the actual production. Yeah. Well, and also being able to interact with a lot of cattlemen that are just doing things flat out right. Um, I was in Guatemala the week before last. Guatemala, I don't want to pick favorites among the Latin American countries. But Guatemala has a really special place in my heart, not just because of the people there, but because of specifically probably three ranches uh, that I, I really think over the last 40 years or more uh, have been just producing the right kind of ramen cattle. Uh, and so whenever you are able to see those cattle, cattle just, you know, in the flesh uh, really, really speaks to you in a lot of ways. And and. Every time I'm I'm down there in that country specifically, um, I come back with such a realignment of what my priorities are uh, mm-hmm. and what what is what is really needed to push to push Brahmin forward and to push the American Brahmin forward. And so uh, I know the three of us we're so lucky to have such good friends specifically in that country. Uh, and it's just man, talk about really helps you put your head on straight whenever you see how they're ranching those cattle. And just the authenticity behind how they're ranching those cattle. Yeah. Now you mentioned the right kind of cattle, and I know everybody has their own version or definition of right. But I think you and I and Rachel and all of us align pretty good on what we think right is. But can you explain to us your slash our version of right? Well, just I think the, with the right kind of Brahmin cattle, you, you never waver from true breed character. Uh, you don't get on board with, with fads. Starting and, the slow clap. <laughs> 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 and, and, and I've said this before, breed character for Brahmin cattle is, is more than just the shape of the face or, or colors. I mean, those are at the forefront, don't get me wrong, but People choose Brahmin cattle time and time again in every one of these countries, including ours, because of true performance and also the productivity aspect. These cattle can go out and hustle until they're 18, 19, 20 years old, many of them still having a calf year after year, bulls that are in their working clothes and getting cows bred um, well into their teens. I mean, Maximus is a 10 year old bull. He's out breeding cows with one nut right now. Okay. That is productive. So, you know, I think back that up one time, because I know the story of why he's only got one, but let folks know that he wasn't born that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he wasn't born that way. He had a horrible infection, uh, probably about three, four years ago. Thank God for Dr. Warner removed one of the testicles, was able to save the other. And unfortunately, his semen no longer freezes whenever we're jumping him. But man, he's he's out there breeding cows, you know, with one nut. And so and he's a 10 year old bull. So I think, <laughs> so you know, is, uh, is Maximus the same age as Noble or Maximus is, yeah. is a 2014. He's the same age as Blair. So they're they're 2014 one, models. One, so one, they're turning one year old. Noble's one yeah. year old. Yeah. Max turns 10 in like three months or something like that. So uh so, yeah, so I think, you know, the right kind of Brahmin cattle are those cattle that are true to their breed character and breed characters just more how more than how they look in the flesh. Um, it, it's really what those cattle can do 
on a year to year basis. And from then you can decide if you like big cattle or moderate cattle or small cattle. That's for, for you to decide. But, but the right kind of Brahmin cattle are in their truest form and breed character. And that goes into productivity. To me, Brahmin cattle are the most athletic cattle built on this earth. Um, and then it's those, you know, desirable breed character, you know, in the flesh traits that we, we know and love them for. Yeah. I mean, just when you boil it down to the most basic level, cattle in general, their sole purpose is for beef production. Yeah. And all the traits that go into that and make them be as productive as possible in environments all over the world, that that's kind of what we're after. So the most, yeah. they got to have good feet. They got to be structurally sound. They've got to, uh, you know, it, it's easy to chase the fads of more bone, more bone, more bone, or yep. more yep. this or that single trait selection that some of those traits can be antagonistic of actual production and fertility. So we've got to be able to keep in mind to to keep everything in balance uh, that we can be efficiently producing beef in, you know, frankly, some of the most hostile environments in the world that can that can really put a, ha- a damper on efficiency and fertility and productivity. Definitely. And my dad, and this is not a popular uh, statement that my dad makes about the show ring, but I think it's also very relevant and true. You should want to be able to eat the champion. So, I mean, I know we don't want to serve Margaret up on a plate, but if you <laughs> had to compare her, you know what I mean? Against a lot of other type cattle um, and also the cattle that we showed. I mean, at the end of the day, like you, you're proud of that beef product. You know, quite that's frankly, right. um, and and that's what that's what we should be focused on. So you know how, like in game shows, they have like a toss up question, or like yes. you know, I'm like, I have a toss up topic for y'all. Oh please, utter utter quality. <laughs> oh, 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 God. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, anyone who's had a conversation with me in the last like four years. You know, it's it's not just a buzz a buzzword for us. I mean, we have got to like, you know, get our act together on on utter quality. From what we found in the red Brahmin side of things, you have genetic lines, and it's such a hit or miss. You know what I mean on how these cattle perform from an for an, from an utter quality standpoint. Um, and, and and I break it down like this: my dad is seventy. We now have a really hard time finding reliable individuals to help with the day-to-day operations for the ranch. The chance of getting those cattle in shoots to milk them so those calves will nurse, that chapter has closed for us at this point. Uh, And I think as the world changes and you look at a lot of these countries to the south of us with growing middle classes trying to employ people and retain them in agriculture to milk a Brahmin cow ain't going to happen over the next 20 or 30 years. I mean, that's just, that's, is what it is. And so that's one of the things, reasons why I'm so passionate about utter quality is because my 70 year old dad is not in the prime of his life to go milk a Brahmin cow. You know what I mean? And that's is well, what neither it is. is this 40 year old over <laughs> yeah, here. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. When Rachel Toss this question out. <laughs> I had to really hold myself back because I was about to swing for the fence. So, with you being our guest, I wanted to let you do it. But I mean, when it boils boils down to it, in in a lot of our, you know, you think about our customers who might are using Brahmin bulls or Brahmin females in hostile environments. They might go gather cattle once or twice a year. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, and if if the cow doesn't have a calf trailing her to the pens when he gets ready to gather those cattle and strip calves off and send them to market, the cows cost you money. And oh, absolutely. she's most likely going to load up on a truck and, yep. and leave. And then she's going to bring 90 cents a pound to, to yep. pack out. And it's yep. hard for her, for her to make that money back and be a profitable business. So yep. what any kind of trait, whether it's udder quality or calf vigor or calving uh, issues, that are going to cause that cow not to be able to bring a calf to the, uh, you know, to the weaning pens unassisted. You know, that that's some issues we need to work on. Not oh, we, ERC and Watkins. He yeah. will mean every breed in, in, in general. In general. general. Yes. Oh yeah. You know, 
we're getting we're gearing up the time of year now here in the here in the U.S. Especially when things start to get colder, where we're going to start seeing bro- baby bombing calves on Facebook oh, in gosh. bathtubs and on yeah. 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 pickup trucks and this and that and having to be tubed and yeah. put on nurse cows and all that kind of stuff. That's not real world. It's not no. practical. It, and it doesn't. A lot doesn't, of the cattle producing areas around the world just yeah. just can't have that. And it not only that does not work for not only just the the big outfits that you know are ranching thousands of head of cattle, but it also doesn't work for that customer of ours. We have a lot of them, both at BRC and at Watkins Cattle, that have they want ten really great, good looking Brahmin cows. They are they maybe don't have a background in cattle ranching, but they fell in love with Brahmin cattle. And man, can you imagine if right out the bat, I mean, you know, they're having a terrible experience with, you know, just the 10 head that they have, you know, that's just, you know, that is, that is a universal um, situation that, you know, impacts all types of ranchers uh, or those type of traits. And, and man, we've, we've just got to continue to push forward on really, you know, udders, dispositions, those type of things. Those are the cattle of the past. Um, yeah, and, and we can't look forward, you know, with those type of genetics. That's absolutely right. Well, we are about 40 minutes in. So what we're going to give you, Stuart, the option. What have we missed? Is there any hot topics that you think we missed today? I guess, you know, one of the things that I'm most excited about is kind of like what is what is next for Brahmin as a whole? You know what I mean? For all of us to collectively kind of like get behind. And so mm-hmm. maybe I'll toss a question back to you and Brandon. I think you know, as, as we enter kind of this next new year and whatnot, I mean, what do you think are going to be maybe some of the more like popular things that we'll see in 2024? Um, you know, I think, I think DNA genomics performance based type stuff is, is the direction that we're going in for sure. Um, but kind of, what do you think are going to be some things that are going to be some big eye openers maybe, you know, as we, as we look forward? I think you could go a couple different ways on this. Like this is not an innovative trait, but I do think that we're that there's like a return to people who really want to strategically breed good cattle and very, you know, methodically like, like I would say the old days of really sitting down and mapping out pedigrees and breeding, you know, strategic breeding to try to get better which I know you do this a lot. We do too, you know, but not just thinking beyond like, well, what I can produce now, but what I can produce, what I can breed these daughters to, or what I can, you know, breed these sons to. And that's like an old school way. But then, I mean, we're working on a, we're working on some really innovative stuff now, like with climate smart ranching and methane emission and all of that. And that blows people's minds, but that that's happening. Brandon, what do you think? You know, I, I would even make it a little more basic than that and just return to the basics. Return mm-hmm. to ranching. Bring yeah, back the yeah. actual functionality of the cattle. Mm-hmm. Definitely. You know, cattle that can be productive with minimal inputs and, uh, and and do it year after year after year and do it for a long time like Brahmins are supposed to. Well, that's yep. what the breed is going to have to get back to if they want to re- remain long-term sustainable beyond just a frivolous show breed. Yeah, you know? When we think about the purpose of using a Brahmin, one is uh, heat tolerance, but the yep. uh, maybe the biggest thing is longevity. And longevity, so, and and I think I, I stand behind this statement, and I, and I say it often. The majority of the world, in my opinion, is eating a Brahmin cow somewhere. You know what I mean? When you look at population densities, you know, and a lot of population densities are found along the equator. Those countries are are ranching Brahmin cattle, and they're eating Brahmin cattle uh, mm-hmm. on a very very large scale, and so. I always kind of like snickered when, you know, people were like, oh, that's not really a carcass breed or this and that. And I'm like, well, I'm in multiple countries every year and I'm hacking through a Brahmin steak somewhere. So, you know what I mean? Like people are eating these cattle uh, all over the world. And so I think oftentimes we forget that in the U.S. because some of these other breeds have such a prominent stance in kind of more of the the meat side of of the industry. Uh, But globally – People are eating Brahmin cattle. And I would like to say, you know, I mentioned longevity, but it's not just about a Brahmin cow living to 20 years. She has to live to 20 years being productive. Exactly. You know, if she lives yes. 20 years and only has five calves during that time. Yeah. yeah. Why even mess with that? You know, exactly. she needs to be calving yearly 
to be yeah. better than any other breed. Yeah. You know, so that's what we need to focus on and get that get the fr- natural fertility and productivity back in the cattle. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I, I do also hope that more people will get educated about how to visually appraise cattle. Um, oh, God, you know, yeah. How to read structure, how to look at it, what a good udder is. And I mean, I see this on Facebook all the time. I don't want to go down this path, but like people saying like, oh, this is my next great one, you know, and it's, it's, it's got some problems. Yeah, it's (laughs) You know, it's not, you know, and it Uh, takes a while to, to like, you know, train your eye or learn how to look at things. But I do wish that more people would pay attention to some of those of how to judge Brahmin cattle or just cattle in general. And uh, I think that also, can help their program. Yeah, we have such a culture within the breed. And, and I call my dad out on it all the time. And, and he'll laugh when I say this. Um, you know, it's like, oh, no, that one goes back to, you know, this cow. And she was the reserve division champion at Houston in 2002. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I am so far past that point right now, <laughs> daddy. You know, like, that's not, right. you know, but we, we have such a culture in the Brahmin breed where people are very sentimental about mm-hmm. previous genetics and, and the cattle and the stories behind them. Um, but sometimes you really just need to be looking forward, you know, and, and yeah. not looking back because I think you'll, you'll, you'll deal with more issues than you will, you know, positives uh, with, with some of those genetics. And this is not targeting one specific animal or anything like that. But I think, you know, we, we have kind of this culture in breeding Brahmin cattle where, you know, everybody wants to put maybe, cattle from yesteryear kind of up on a pedestal uh and that's not always right yeah that's great I, I haven't really heard the phrase sentimental in breeding cattle but that's a I wrote that down because that is great but sentimental is not breeding today's champions no. or today's yeah. functional <laughs> yeah. animals realistically exactly. I mean not, the animals not paying the are, bills at home yeah. no <laughs> sentimental is not, not not moving you forward no well uh, but Speaking of sentimental, I'm we're gonna kind of wrap up, but this is our this is a question we like to ask every um, podcast guest is if they have a favorite animal of all time, or if you don't necessarily have a favorite, if there was one animal you could go back in history and you visually see in person, you know, who would those be for you? Man, that's such a hard question because you know I. Ha- like y'all, I have such a love for genetics and the cattle and, and man, to go back and create, you know, one more over again. I don't really, maybe my mind just doesn't work that way. I have such an appreciation for cattle at a certain time, but I don't think there's any, I haven't gone down the path of cloning yet. I haven't, you know, I just, maybe, you know, I'm just not wired that way. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think there's any, anyone that really jumps right out in my mind there there's some cattle there's there's a cow hk966 and a lot of my best stuff stems from her um she was a a top just natural producer at hk and her sons were visa brazil and 624 and a 173 cow that a lot of my stuff stemmed from and just to kind of you know see maybe that what that cow was kind of in the flesh i think I, i would really appreciate um there's some cattle in other countries that I would like to, you know, maybe have had my eyes on, you know, a little bit sooner, you know, here and there. But, um, but I recreate, I, I, I struggle with that because I just, I, I'm always looking to how to produce the next one, best one, not go back and, you know, time, yeah. time zap them. Oh, I love that. Well, so would Maximus be your, you know, your most, your most favorite animal, the animal you're the proudest of? Yeah, probably the animal I'm the most proud of. I, I will say whenever I bought that initial group of red cows, there was a cow that's branded 101. And whenever I see that cow in the pasture, I, I just get immensely happy. I, I want to breed red Brahmin cattle that look like that for the rest of my life. She's a very moderate red cow. She was so ahead of her time. Um, her daughters are shaping our program right now. And, uh, I don't know when I, when I see that cow, we call her freckles. When I see that cow, I just, I get just immensely happy. Um, and it's hard to describe. It's very hard to describe, but, um, you know, she's not a cow that won a ton for me or anything like that, but you know, she, she definitely just has that, that look and, and those traits that are just, you know, 
are timeless. I, I love that quote. I'm like, whenever I see that Brahmi cow, I just, <laughs> I just get happy. Get, I just get happy. Yeah. A lot of people, yeah. a lot of people can relate to that quote. <laughs> it happens to me driving down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I remember as a really, really young kid, and we'd go into like Lafayette, Louisiana, which is kind of the bigger, the big city compared to where we grew up. And when you pass through the town of Scott, Louisiana, you had to pass like right in front of Johnny Jeffcoat's Double J Ranch. And man, I'd always make Dad pull over that so we could, you know, that, yeah, they had um, the Bird Bull Factory on it. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it, with the ranch that he had, like in town, we'd have to drive right by it to get to kind of where we were going. And uh, dad pull over and we, you know, look at the cattle from the car and, you know, it's just, you know, there's something about these type of cattle. You're either meant for them or you're not, I guess. Uh, and from a, such a young age, I've always been just so captivated by Brahmin cattle. And, and now that I get to spend my life not only breeding Brahmin cattle, but promoting Brahmin cattle, uh, because I think those two really go in hand in hand in my life's work. It's not only breeding these, you know, top cattle that shape the industry, but then also you got to get out there and promote them. Um, and you got to, you got to tell the story and you got to, you know, show people why they, why they're timeless and they're so important. And, and I enjoy that aspect just as much. And that comes through judging shows through just getting out there in those countries, boots on the ground and, and seeing what works and, and seeing those cattle where they thrive. Yeah, that was amazing. Well, we're we're now approaching almost the hour mark. And I just oh. have to say, I as every conversation we have together, I love hearing your insights and your thoughts and just love how there's a group of us young breeders that, you know, work together and push each other and, and encourage and spur each other just to make the breed better. Definitely. I mean, that's, can you imagine if we didn't have any... Uh, you know, if all of us just were kind of just kind of in our own lanes, doing our own thing and not really collaborating in, in some way, shape or form. I mean, life would get pretty damn boring. So <laughs> I think <laughs> having y'all makes it such a treat. And, and uh, I just appreciate kind of what the whole team at BRC has been able to do for, for our program. It, it's not just Brandon and Rachel. It's, you know, there's a there's a lot of people there that make the world go round. And it's a lot of fun in the process. Thanks. Well, we have so enjoyed this, Stuart, and I know our listeners have too. And so we're just going to wrap up the episode with a big thank you to you and just to say thank you and good luck to Watkins in the upcoming year. And you know, thank you to everyone for listening to the Over the Hump podcast. And we will see you all on the next episode. See you next time. Hey guys, we hope that you're enjoying the Over the Hump podcast. We've had so many great reviews and great feedback from this podcast, and we've had several people asking how they can support it. So we are proud to announce that we've created the Over the Hump fan club, where you can join and sign up on a yearly basis to help support this podcast and get some really cool merch as well. We have three different levels ranging from $40 a year to $250 a year. And at each level, you get some really cool different benefits and different free gifts. For example, at our Trailblazer level, you get a free copy of my really awesome Modern Brahmin coffee table book, which is a 160 page coffee table book featuring the gorgeous photography of Carlos Guizor from Mexico, along with Brahmin history written by me. And then our Supreme Stockman level, which is $250 a year, includes that plus free access to the Brahmin Academy for one year. And at our Trailblazer and Supreme Stockman levels, you also get a discount to use in the BRC online store, um, which you can use for anything that's in the store, including semen, AI certificates, show cattle camp, event registrations, and more. So this is a really great opportunity, um, especially if you purchase a lot of semen or AI certificates from us. You can join the fan club and get some great discounts to use throughout the whole year. So if you like this podcast and want to help support it, you can sign up for the Over the Hump fan club at shopbrcutrer.com. That's shopbrcutrer.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you're enjoying it. You've been listening to the Over the Hump Podcast. Our passion is Brahmin cattle, and it runs deep. And this show is about its rich history 
industry trends, and stories that define the American Brahmin. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you did, make sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, find us on Instagram and Facebook at BR Contraire. See you next time on the Over the Hump Podcast.